This week is National Sugar Awareness Week. So to kick off this episode, we look at the impact that sugar could be having on our health. Now I'm thrilled today to invite back two guests that were appeared on last season. You might recognize their names, which is Dr. Tim Spector and Dr. Sarah Berry. Tim is a co-founder of the Zoe Health app and Dr. Sarah Berry is the lead nutritional scientist on the Zoe Health app and the Zoe study. This study is designed, you know, the big if study we're calling it for intermittent fasting, allows people to choose their own times they want to do it. And this is very much exactly what we want to find out because the data isn't out there. All the studies have been very small scale. Firstly, you can try and counterbalance some of the downstream unfavourable effects of having these refined carbohydrates and sugars. So making sure you're adding in polyphenol-rich foods. These are like firefighters that sort of dampen down that fire that's initiated by having really high sugar foods in the short term. After interviewing them both, I really wanted to bring them back on into this season together. Not only do they have very similar views on the research points of nutritional science and the impacts of sugar, our diet, and all the multifactorial processes that can affect our overall health, but they also do lead quite different lifestyles. Sarah being a very busy mum with two demanding children and a full-time job, and Tim, who does live the life, as you would predict, being the health guru that he is, constantly having his kefir and sauerkraut at the ready. So I was very interested to hear their views and bring up a little bit of controversy around the subject. We really delve deep into the impacts of sugar. We look at what sugar is, what the difference is between refined and natural sugars. And we also then look at the links with artificial sweeteners and sugars on our health. Finally, we do a deep dive into intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating because this week they have launched a study that is available for you all now to sign up to and be a part of to help see the impacts that time-restricted eating could have on your health. So if you're really interested in that, do skip towards the end where you'll gain a lot of information on how you can sign up to the study. But overall, this is a really insightful, interesting and a little bit controversial at times, conversation around the impacts of sugar and our health. Tim, Sarah, welcome to Live Well, Be Well. Thank you so much for coming back. It's great to be here. I'm really pleased that I've got you two on because last season I had you both on separately and went to both your houses. And even though you're both working in the same field, both at Zoe, Tim, you're the co-founder of Zoe and Sarah, you're the chief nutritional scientist. I loved that even though your day-to-day lives are quite different to the research that you're bringing out. So I'm very excited to unravel that today with first of all talking about the Eat Well Plate, which I really want to ask you about, which is the public health guidelines that we actually give out in the UK to help people follow a healthy lifestyle. And then we're going to go into sugar and looking at the impacts of sugar on our diet, because this is going to come out during Sugar Awareness Week. Mm. And it's a really big one. I know, Tim, you speak about sugar a lot and ultra-processed foods, and we touched upon that with you, Sarah, last time. But before we delve into it, and also your new study, which is coming out on time-restricted eating, which would be out by the time this is being released, I want to ask you a question, which I actually asked you, Sarah, last time, but Tim, I didn't get to ask you, which is what have you both changed your mind about in the last 10 years? Now, this can be about anything. Well, it would fill more than one hour of podcast just to tell you all the things <laughs> I've changed my mind on. What the best breakfast is, um, is coffee good or bad for you, that salt is not really that bad for you, um, that ultra-processed food is worse than I thought, uh, fish isn't as good as I thought it was for you. Um, can you explain that for me? Why did you not think fish, fish? is Fish? Oh, that yeah. surprised you, was it? Yeah, well, because my topic of interest is omega-3, which heavily relates to fish. So I'm quite interested to see why your views changed on that. Well, just the last few years, research has come out that summarised lots of the other studies and assumed it was so clear-cut there was no point in looking at it, really. Mm. Uh, But when I was writing Food for Life, I had to look at all the studies again and basically showed that if you took all the epidemiology studies that say after fish eaters get less heart disease than non-fish eaters and they live longer the answer is yes they do they do benefit but it's much less than i'd thought it's only around 10 percent 
benefit, which is sort of within the margins of error of these epidemiology studies, because fish eaters have other healthy habits that you can't adjust for. So it wasn't really as dramatic. I thought it'd be twice as long or, you know, these sort of amazing things. And then you say, well, everyone says the benefits of fish eating are because of Mm omega-3. So then all the epidemiology studies of omega-3 generally supportive, but the gold standard is the randomized controlled trial. And there have now been some massive ones with like 50,000 people in these trials for years in the U.S., cost you know millions and millions of dollars to to do and those results where they compared a placebo against uh, omega-3 and looked at heart disease and mortality etc showed overall no difference between the two groups and the only group that benefited were males who'd had recently in the last six months had a heart attack Mm. so that changed my mind about blindly recommending fish to everybody and that you know this should be at the core of our nutrition advice because what I'm saying is unless you're very deficient the omega-3 story extra doesn't really help you and general fish eating isn't as healthy as we've been led to believe it's not unhealthy but what about it for our brain health what I saw in human studies there's no clear evidence that it does any of that There was lots of studies 20 years ago about kids, giving it to kids for attention in class and ADHD ADHD and all this stuff. And the quality of those studies is rubbish. Most of it was paid for by marketing of these vitamin companies. And it really didn't... Is that the one coming out of Oxford University that you were talking about? I'm not naming any names, but (laughs) they they were generally all done rather rapidly Mm. at this huge time. They got celebrities and important people to front them and it turns out you know they really were not very solid at all Mm -hmm. and weren't done very well and so when you look at it there really is no evidence to support that omega-3 helps concentration exams uh, etc for for kids Mm -hmm. and so you put all that together then you add in what you know i'm interested now is the effect on the environment Mm -hmm. and suddenly well, not even not even going that far, but just if you advise, if everybody did as they were told and had two portions of fish a week, we would run out of fish in the world within two years. So most of our fish now comes from fish farms. There's all kinds of other problems with it. Um, you know, it's the same problems as uh, on land mm-hmm. once you start farming intensively animals. So all those things together. That's the, that's the long answer to why I've changed my mind about fish. It doesn't mean I don't eat fish. I eat less of it, and I try and get good stuff that I know where it comes from. And you know, I try and really enjoy it rather than just having it for the sake of doing it because I said, oh, it's really crucial for my health. Gosh, that is not what I expected, but I'm really pleased that you said that. Even though I, there's parts for me that I'm very passionate about omega-3, just from my own journey of being neurodivergent and looking at some some research but i'm now going to dive more into that after what i've just heard from no i think we have to revisit all these things and you know realize that science is moving yes exactly just because 10 years ago you know you believed solidly that that was the case absolutely uh we've got to keep Keep open to to new ideas and the idea that we think about anything in terms of just one ingredient Mm. one miracle cure I yeah. think, it, you know, that just happens to have lots of companies behind it, I think is very dangerous. And so we just need to always keep looking at it, always be critical of everything we're, we're advising and, and, and take a more holistic picture. That's, that is essential, the, the full view, because it's multifactorial and it, it's not just one thing, which is really important. Yeah, and there's lots of ways to get omega-3 and rather than in a bottle. Sarah knows all this stuff. You know, it, you know plants are perfectly good way of getting omega-3. Sarah, what's your view that you've changed in the last 10 years? Anything in relation to what Tim said or something totally different? So I think, yeah, some different aspects. So I was brought up in the 70s, 80s at the whole kind of uh, discovery of genetics and importance of genetics. And so I remember always being told, oh, it's all in your genes. And I think one thing that's changed, particularly working with Tim and working Mm. on the Zoe Predict studies, is actually realising that it's not all in our genes from our weight to how we respond to food so that's one thing that's definitely I've changed my opinion on I think the other thing is as well is that before I was very focused in a quite a reductionist way about food so I've spent the first 20 
years of my research career looking at dietary fats, but looking at the structure of dietary fats. And the last five years has really made me take a step back and in the way that Tim said, that we need to think more holistically. So not just thinking about the type of foods that we're eating or even the nutrients that we're eating, but thinking also about how we're living our lives and the importance of the how we eat. So the importance of the kind of factors I know when I met you before and we did a previous podcast about, you know, whether it's the time of day or how much sleep we've had or how much exercise we've done, how all of that actually can modulate how we respond to food. Absolutely. Do you know what your area that we spoke about and how you eat blew up on our TikTok post? The amount... (laughs) We had over half a million views, I think, in 24 hours from Sarah with the almond comment around how it's actually metabolised if it's ground or if it's in a whole form. And people couldn't get over the change from the composition of a food component. That's the same food, but it's just processed in a different way. So I say definitely go and listen to that episode if, if you're interested. And we're going to come on to the how near the end of the podcast. But something that I'm really interested to start the podcast off on is is the eat well plate because Sarah I brought this up with you during our conversation and off mic you said please ask him the same <laughs> question on the eat well plate so uh, are you Tim, gonna ask it to me again well what did she tea? answer <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> did she say it was marvelous I don't think so I said something very different to what I think you're going to say yeah but well, you're not going to tell me Sarah was quite rounded in her view because I was less rounded. I think that obviously it has changed in the last few years. They've taken out the Coca-Cola, but they've just popped it to the side. Um, But they've actually still not increased the fat content, which is something that I know we speak a lot about and actually fat isn't bad for us. It's not harmful for us. And the view on that has changed. But it is what we are representing to the UK as the healthy eating guideline now is to nutritional scientists sitting here who have so much evidence in this area I'd love to have your thoughts on what you think the eat well plate represents and is it a good representation it represents our thinking of 10 to 20 years ago and it really hasn't uh, come up with the times and I don't think it actually reflects current experts in nutrition in the US and the UK Mm. so I just think it's it's just very out of date very stale and it's influenced strongly by the food industry and other parties that are not impartial and really don't want to see major changes to this. And, yeah, as you said, it still reflects this very old view, which I don't think is, is now the current majority of people, you know, demonise fats. Mm. And also trying to say, you know, and if you don't have fats, you've either got to eat all carbs or, or uh, protein. And I think... The, um, the idea about protein levels is also pretty much nonsense. So that mm. basically what they're saying is if you, do, if you restrict fats, you've got to have large numbers of carbohydrates to fill the gap. That's where we get this advice about eating starchy carbs and things, which I think is completely wrong. And mm. yes, there are some good bits in it. You know, clearly we should eat more fruits and vegetables, but their advice about having low-fat foods low fat which means low fat ultra processed foods always they're encouraging people to go in that line i think that is completely wrong and uh, you know is really just uh, because of the you know the corruption behind how these guidelines uh, occur and the lobbying power of, of big food sarah So I hold a slightly different opinion to Tim in terms of the power of the lobbying and and food industry, Mm -hmm. but we're going to have to agree to disagree on this. I do agree with Tim with regards to the whole low-fat area of the Eat Well plate. I think that there's really robust evidence now that healthy fats are a really important component of our diet, and to actually reduce our fat intake has an unfavourable effect on our health. My issue with being overcritical of the Eat Well plate is that I think that we should put our efforts elsewhere in terms of thinking what what are the good components of the Eat Well plate, and I think there are lots of good components. I think there's really robust evidence for some components of of the Eat Well plate, but I'm not saying it's perfect. I think the biggest problem is is people aren't following dietary guidelines. So we know in the UK less than 1% of people actually follow the key dietary guidelines in the UK. We also know from research that I've conducted at King's that if we put people on the eat well plate versus the current UK diet, so we there's a big survey in the UK called the NDNS survey 
that tells us about what people are currently eating. When we conducted this really large parallel study where we had a whole group of people eating for 12 weeks, the uh, similar to the Eat Well plate, and then we had another group of people eating the typical UK diet, we saw really huge improvements in lots of health outcomes for those following the Eat Well plate. But we can do better, that's mm -hmm. what I think. So I think that I wouldn't say it's nonsense, I would say that it's a good foundation, that some things aren't right, but we can definitely do better. One thing that I think we can actually do a lot better on is that we can move away from this one-size-fits-all approach that we have mm. with the Eat Well Plate. We can start to think about that middle ground between the one-size-fits-all, the population-based guidelines, and that whole individual level. So there's this area in the middle where we can really give individual advice based on groupings of characteristics. Mm. And I think that's something that we really need to be thinking about when we're giving this kind of uh, general population-based advice. So coming on to that is sugar, because 56% of our diet in the UK comes from ultra-processed foods. So that's quite worrying. And then from that statistic, 62% of the sugar we eat is found in ultra-processed foods. So I think before we even begin, what is sugar? Just so to give people a fundamental understanding of, of what it is and how can, they, how can they spot it? How can they even be aware if they're consuming it? Are we aware, as we think we are, or not? So I think that's one of the big problems, and this is one of the problems with ultra-processed food. So you've said that 62% uh, of our sugar intake comes from ultra-processed food. We know about 70% of our salt intake comes from ultra-processed food. And the thing is, we're just not aware of this. And I think as well that there's a lot of miscommunication, firstly about the health effects of sugar, but also about what's actually in our food. So you see on the front of lots of foods, low, no, or, or reduced sugar, but actually they're still packed with sugar, you know, like baked beans, for example. Mm. But if we take a step back and actually think about what else could be considered almost in a similar way to sugar, we know that sugar is a carbohydrate, and we know that carbohydrates are ultimately broken down to different types of sugars. So any of the kind of refined carbohydrates that we're also consuming far too much of, in my opinion. So a lot of these are staples. So lot, uh, white rice, for example, white bread, white pasta. These are actually broken down to these simple molecules that we call sugar. And it's these simple uh, molecules of carbohydrates that circulate in our blood that cause these downstream unfavorable effects for us. Mm -hmm. So it just means that, you know, having a, a bowl of white rice or actually a spoonful of sugar in your tea can ultimately have the same effects. So that's why you know, we shouldn't be demonizing mm. one particular added sugar mm -hmm. when you've got the source of the sugar there that we're ignoring. Mm -hmm. And that's why and that's what manufacturers use to sort of try and trick you to say, well, added sugar is zero because we've got all these starches and things, which is the way plants store sugar uh, in the food. It is, again, about educating people and not demonising, not being too reductionist again, mm -hmm, yeah. to uh, attack only sugars, because if you do that, you're falling into the trap, just like we demonise fats. The food industry just changed the name of it, they move it around, they, you can't see it, and at least there's 50 different names for mm -hmm. sugar you can find on the back of a label, of ways that they can add sugar without you seeing it. It's really important that people understand that all carbohydrates potentially can produce these much smaller sugar molecules, which end up as, you know, I mean, like, like table sugar, essentially, the sucrose, and except things that have high amounts of fibre in it. And those carbohydrates are the ones that aren't broken down that easily to sugars, and so most of them are healthy. So that's what people need to think about when they're talking about sugar, is this more general idea of it. And that, in a way, you've got carbohydrates with different levels of how quickly they give off their smaller sugar molecules mm -hmm. that get into the blood and cause problems. And understand that all the different words there are out there for uh, what is actually sugar when you're in the, in the ultra-processed foods. You don't have this problem in real foods. Mm -hmm. You've basically just got starches and fibres, mm -hmm. and it's quite easy to work out actually what you're eating. It's these foods made in factories where they use all kinds of mysterious names to fool you particularly in low-fat products, because they have to fill that space mm. with either protein or sugars and trick you with artificial other sweeteners and, uh, and colorants. And so I think, do you know, I think 
picking up on what you said, Tim, so one of the big problems is as well that the other nutrients that are in the food, so I know we've already said this, but you just can't look at a nutrient in isolation. Yes. And so the problem is, is that many of the sugars that we're eating or refined carbohydrates that end up being processed as sugars in our blood have lots of other unfavorable components in those foods. And also in nutrition, we always need to think about our diets in terms of what we're displacing. And so the same with a food. So in the same way that Tim said, within a food, if you're taking the sugar out, what are you putting in? But the same within your diet, if you naturally have a tendency to want more uh, sugary, so more sweet foods, then what is it that you're going to be replacing and displacing? And I think that's a really important consideration. Before we go on to that is the natural sugars versus the mm-hmm. refined sugars. So I think it's really interesting when you obviously just mentioned that sugar is sugar. Biochemically acts the same as our body. It doesn't notice that white sugar might be different to a natural sugar, but there's different processes that can help slow that release, the sugar within our, within our blood glucose. But there's so many products, especially in the last five to 10 years, such as smoothies and juices and things that are very sweet and appetizing to us, but are also labeled as healthy. How can we, as a consumer, start to understand the right decisions and the correct decisions to help optimize our health? Because I do think if we're looking at fruit and we're thinking this is healthy, but actually if we're having a smoothie that's having all of the fiber taken out, then it is not gonna be having a favorable impact as much as we think we are. So how can we actually start to understand more around the types of sugars that we should be leaning towards and the ones that actually are more detrimental? I think that that's a real confusing subject for so Mm -hmm. many people really trying to make the right choice, but being misled. It's all about educating people and re-educating them as the science is is making it obvious that Mm. just because it says healthy on the pack, we do not have the support from government or... Uh, the Trade Descriptions Act to actually separate those out Mm -hmm. because they'll find ways to make it look like it's healthy and it's up to the consumer to actually realise that, no, this isn't healthy Mm -hmm. Um, just because it's got nice pictures of fruit on the the cover and things Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, healthy people jumping around doesn't mean it's... and it's low calories or no added sugar. All these tricks, the more stuff they've got on on that label telling you how healthy it is, it usually means you should avoid it. Mm. And I think people have just got to become more savvy because Mm -hmm. they're not getting the protection from the government they need. And we now know that, uh, as Sarah said, the structure of food is absolutely crucial. So there are huge differences between eating an orange, whole orange, eating orange juice with the the pulp in it, um, and, and then having sort of orange juice extracts uh, with only the sugary bits and all the sort of substance taken mm. out. And that has a massive effect on our bodies. So people need to understand that not only is the, uh, the, you know, the ingredients important, but also uh, how it's actually been made. And mm. it does, is it something you could make at home? So what's the impact it has on our blood glucose? Because that's a really big determinant of our health. And I know that's something that you look at very closely at Zoe. So one of the links that I think is really important for people to be aware of is the impact that has on our blood sugar and the impact then that has overall on our, on our well-being and our health, not just obesity, but other things such as gut microbiome. Could you explain a bit about how much too much sugar can cause health impacts, unfavorable health impacts? It's quite easy, actually, because when you, when you have things with uh, lots of sugar in it, Generally, it gets absorbed before the gut microbes get involved. Mm-hmm. So the thing about ultra-processed foods and ultra-sweet foods is that it's so highly refined, you, you basically don't have to... It's all broken down for you. You know, it's like baby food. Uh, you don't have to do any work. Just it gets into the stomach and then into the small intestine and it's suddenly in the bloodstream. So you can call it like fast food. I often describe uh, refined carbohydrates or sugar as fast sugars, fast mm. carbohydrates. And then you've got slow food, so slow carbohydrates, which are better for you. Yeah, and that's where you get the fibre, and they don't cause a peak in your, your blood sugar because very little sugar is being absorbed. That Most of the absorption in sugar goes up fairly high up in the intestinal tract. So sugar will give you a big uh, sugar peak, but as, as uh, we showed in the Zoe Predict study, that can vary tenfold between people. The three of us all had the same muffin at the same time, would show big differences in how large that sugar peak was 
which also is reflecting what's happening to our insulin levels and how quickly it comes down and whether it, we dip below the baseline or not. And all these things have a big effect on our body, on our mood, on our energy, and ultimately it turns out on our appetite. So the microbes aren't affected directly by sugar, we don't think, although there probably is some signaling mechanism going on that we're still to elaborate about how the microbes know what to expect to eat. We think something's happening there, but it, it, it's still being worked out. So most of the effects of sugar are the non-microbiome mechanisms through the ones well known about you know triggering your insulin, and that is hugely variable, and that's what everyone really needs to know to say, well, how do you work out what breakfast to eat? Are you a high-carb person or a high-fat person? That's the research that you know Sarah and I have been mean doing it varies hugely between people so mm. my sugar response is very bad um, since i last saw yeah. you both i've done yeah I've done what's the, yours like i'm all for metabolizing carbohydrates which i knew anyway from you know being a nutritionist myself and being you know very highly aware of the food that i eat and how it makes me feel but i'm fantastic at fats mm. i mean i'm literally at the top end of the scale for fats and lucky I'm at you the bottom end of the scale <laughs> for sim- carbohydrates I'm similar to that <laughs> So that was really interesting. And even though it's something that I was aware of myself, having it in black and white data form to actually show me that that is actually how my body reacts just cements that thought, I think, a bit further, which is, is really helpful. But something that I also want to bring up here, which is, I think... And most people don't know. No, so most people don't Most know. people that don't realise. They don't... Either they don't get enough of those bad sensations after having carb meals to pick it up, they don't, or they're not self-aware enough, or they haven't just thought about it. So I think, I think we mustn't pretend that most people can actually work this out themselves. I, I think, have to say, you know, eating those hard. muffins was hard. I really struggled. I was meant to be doing it before I was meant to come and see you for the podcast. And I think you said, your brain might not be firing as, a, <laughs> as you hope. So I delayed it a week. And it's true. I mean, there was the first one I was like, it's fine. But then I had to soak them in coffee to allow them to be more palatable. But well, some people love the berry muffins, you know. They're, we, they're, Sarah has a fan club of people saying, so where can I get more of these from? Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's the majority. <laughs> Damn it. And I, I designed these 20... Well, I designed these 20 something years ago, and despite the fact that I don't do any cooking at home, that's the one thing that I can be really proud about is my muffins. We've now had thousands and thousands of people consume these. So, we're, on our Zoe Predict studies, we've had 45,000 complete the Zoe Predict studies, and each person has to consume multiple muffins. So, this is like, this will be on my gravestone about my, the berry She's muffin. going to do the muffin cookbook, is be the next Amazing. cookbook. Yeah, she'll be doing a world tour. Antioxidants and uh, in this one. May, may I just add that these muffins were designed to be a, a stress to the system. So, these muffins are what we call a metabolic uh, challenge meal. Mm. So, they are really high in fat. They've got 50 grams of fat. They're really high in refined carbohydrates. They've got 85 grams of carbohydrates. So, that we can stress the system. So, we can look at your peaks in glucose the shape of your glucose curve after you consume them your dips in glucose and it's really interesting that you should say that you found it really insightful monitoring your glucose uh, during the study i have to say i kept my blood glucose monitor on for weeks after i went to glastonbury during this time it was quite interesting to watch my uh, my peaks over glastonbury as well as muffins but it was fascinating yeah people love seeing this because what's amazing is at, at, in real time you can see what's happening yeah. so you know most people don't think that much about what's actually happening as they consume the food to their body they think oh well in 10 20 years time you know we might see an effect and this is what's been great actually about the covid pandemic for the first time ever people are faced with their own morbidity and mortality that actually we need to do something about it and we have the same effect when people wear continuous glucose monitors they can see for all their different meals you know how big their peak is which we know is important because it's linked to inflammation they can see how big their dip is which we know is important because it's linked to hunger and energy intake And that's something also that I want to come on to, actually, which is something that I found from having those muffins. But something, again, that I think is very linked to sugar is is weight gain. Now, that's something that I think is really important because we are, and I never say this lightly, but we are in an obesity epidemic. You know, there's so many people now that are really struggling with their weight. And many people are constantly going on diets, which, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of because I think it's more about a lifestyle change. And there's many different factors. It's not just the food that you eat that is impacting your weight, but it's a very big determinant of what is impacting your weight gain. 
how is sugar impacting this? Because I think that's something that we might be totally unaware of. We might be eating less calories, which I know is calories, not a calorie. And so people reduce their calories, but they're not looking at the actual nutrients within that. So how does sugar impact our weight? So I that's think a big one. I yeah, think that people are aware I think of. it's really complicated. I think there's, like you say, loads of different aspects to this, mm. um, and we can look quite simply what happens immediately after you consume sugar, and then we can think about what the long term effects are. So immediately after you consume sugar, you have a big increase in circulating sugar in the blood, that sets off a whole downstream cascade of events such as inflammation, oxidative stress, that then feeds back and might drive um, other factors but what also happens quite often is some people get these big dips in glucose so about two to three hours after you consumed sugar or refined carbohydrates you get a dip here often. it's about one in four people regularly get them yeah. some we can all get them but yeah you know, it's about one in four sort of consistently get them and you'll see it if people wearing continuous glucose monitors you can see it or you might feel it like i get dips and so i get more hangry than i typically am or i might feel a bit shaky mm. or a bit like lightheaded and what we know from our own zoe predict studies is that those people that have these big dips go on to feel a lot more hungry they consume their next meal when they're kind of left to their own devices about half an hour before people that don't have these dips they consume over a 24-hour period about 300 calories more than people that don't have dips and that's really important because we're so clever as human beings in maintaining a set point in our energy intake so what tends to happen is this is part of the problem with diet drinks is you might have a diet drink but actually you'll go on to compensate for those calories typically at your next meal so it was really interesting that we saw that this was sustained over these 24-hour periods because of these dips so that's just one mechanism whereby sugar is driving you know this increased energy intake we know as well when you have a dip you're suddenly like i said feeling hungry so then you're quickly consuming more refined carbohydrates to quickly get your sugar back up we know also that you start to crave more sugar that's a big one sugar cravings yeah and you you have a part of your brain that is like a reward part of your brain that craves more sugar more refined carbohydrates more of these quick foods as i call them so mm. that they're quickly metabolized and you just end up on this kind of cycle of like you know up and down and up and down and mm. and it's like you, you kind of need to go cold turkey a little bit and <laughs> come off them and you know go through a few days of re-establishing that set point as well yeah I, I did I did 24 hours just eating muffins and it was probably the worst 24 hours of my life no offense uh, so. Tim, you generally are a health guru from your house you when I turned up you had a Ukrainian mm-hmm. dish that you just cooked in kefir with radishes and you know, when I opened your fridge, it was like pristine. And I was like, you actually live by the book. So that must be quite traumatic so when, for you. When Tim was doing, Tim <laughs> was never doing the same, th- well, we were doing it at the same time. I um, didn't find them too tough. Obviously, I'm biased because I've been consuming these on and off for the last 20 something years when I've had to test them for my research. Tim was sending me texts with like pulling awful faces, how terrible he found it, how it was so challenging. Sarah's probably more <laughs> used to it than I was, but for 24 hours, just for t- we were pre-testing the, the, for the Zoe Predict study, and one thing we wanted to know is, you know, are the peaks different in the mornings or the evenings if you have mm-hmm. the, the same muffin? And so myself and a few other people at Zoe took them every f- four hours, we'd be only eating these muffins as our source of energy. I was allowed the odd coffee, like you, um, and water. That was it. And I've never felt so ill while still being you know, healthy uh, in my life, really, because I was having these massive peaks and these massive dips. And I couldn't concentrate. I had no energy. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was on some drug or something. And I'd, that was the first time ever that I'd made this association between actually you know, my blood sugar mm-hmm. and how I felt. You know, spent my my youth doing nutrition. I wasn't really sort of into this sort of stuff, mm. so I didn't even think it was a, a real item. But when you see this, suddenly you see this link between uh, mood and food, yeah, and and when you really push it, I mean, let's face it, this isn't just average. You know, this is a lot. This is quite a, a stress on the body. Everyone could can experience this mm. and and how it does change your mood, how you can't concentrate at work, and how you are craving something else. You know. Well, they do reference, and it's kind of, it's quite a funny reference, that sugar is cocaine for the brain. And many people reference it as a drug, but it's addictive. 
What's your kind of take on that? Like, do you think sugar is addictive? Do you think that the more we consume, the more we crave, and then actually we can get on the Sicilic cycle to not get off the sugar bandwagon? I don't think it meets any criteria of addiction. So I think that's that's been uh, overhyped, really. But some people physically, I mean, when I put up a post and said, we're doing sugar, a podcast on sugar, what's everyone's question? How do I reduce it? How do I get off it? I'm addicted to sugar. It just seems that people feel that there is this innate addiction to that. They can't reduce it from their day to day whether it's an addiction or not i guess is i think it's more those questions it's more the spikes and troughs rather than uh, uh, well there, there's a hedonistic part of your brain that craves it but i think the biggest problem is these kind of peaks and troughs this cycle that you get into mm. and i think if you can start to just reduce those down how will people do that how would we come off sugar from tim somebody who doesn't live on any sugar and sarah you have quite a lot of sugar in your diet I don't actually particularly like high sugar foods. And I must say, doing the continuous glucose monitoring experiment, I found really enlightening. And we, Tim and I, did this challenge of um, a fast food meal with a full sugar Coke. And I don't generally drink sweet drinks. And my, do you remember, I was telling you, my heart rate went up by 10 beats per minute. I felt absolutely awful. I was almost getting like palpitations. <laughs> and this is despite me having quite a normal diet. I'm nowhere near as healthy as Tim. I felt rubbish Mm. for about an hour. I felt really awful having this big sugar spike and then the dip that I had later. Wasn't it the burger that did that as well? I don't know, there was plenty of fat in that burger, but we, we, we did the, the, the Big Mac challenge. The <laughs> things, the sacrifices we, we make for research. It, it was a so. bigger sacrifice for Tim than it was for yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. There's things that you can do. So firstly, you can try and counterbalance some of the downstream unfavorable effects of having these refined carbohydrates and sugars. So making sure you're adding in polyphenol-rich foods. So these are particular chemicals that are in kind of pigmented heavily pigmented fruits, vegetables, dark chocolate, for example, red wine. And so these are like firefighters that sort of dampen down that fire that's initiated by having really high sugar foods in the short term. But in terms of changing how your brain is perceiving these, I think it's very much the approach that you also take with salt, for example. So it's about retraining your taste buds, retraining your you know re- receptors in your brain. And we know that chefs, for example, become... Uh, quite neutral to being able to taste salt and adding more and more and it's like I would say to people every now and then to kind of have a few reset days allow you to readjust your taste buds um, and then um, you know then you can kind of gradually go back up but hopefully you wouldn't be going back up to the same level of sugar that you were before. Well Mm -hmm. and most of us you know started as kids having lots of when we started having tea for example Mm -hmm. uh, you know lots of spoons of sugar in it's how you get kids onto tea and then gradually get weaned off it just weaning yourself off a lot of these ultra processed snacks and uh, the idea that you have to have sugary snacks every three hours for Mm. example is very much a habit Mm. but once you're in it it is sort of hard to break so you've just Mm. got to go slowly down okay rather than two biscuits I'll go to one biscuit and then half a biscuit and then you know a quarter and then you drop it and you say oh I managed to do it I didn't need that break which you probably only needed because you had a carby breakfast that gives you a spike at you know 10 30 in the morning and a dip you know so it's just realizing what's going on in your body and then trying to make some sensible things which if you do it gradually is not really a problem yeah and i think snacks is a really good way as well of targeting the sugar in your diet so we know that 20 percent of our energy in the uk and in many countries actually comes from snacks so for an average person, I know uh, I hate to talk about averages, but just to give it some context for people, let's say a typical person consumes about 2,000 calories a day. That's 400 calories on average for most people is coming from the snacks that they consume. And we know that the snacks in the UK and most countries are, have a higher amount of sugar, they have a higher amount of salt, they have a lower amount of fibre, and they're very poor in these bioactives like polyphenols. Mm. And so if you can replace these unhealthy snacks so I'm not talking about people already snacking on nuts for example but for people that are snacking on very typical UK snacks if you can replace those with more healthy snacks then that's one strategy a simple single Mm. strategy that you can really improve the healthiness of your diet whilst also reducing your sugars and whilst reducing that kind of oscillation that you get throughout the day so what's your two go-to snacks are they the same are they quite different (laughs) What do you think? <laughs> I just really want to get some controversy in there. 
Tim doesn't snack. Do you snack ever? Uh, yes, I'm a partial to nuts. So rather boring snacks, but I love nuts. Which so nuts? Are my favourites are cashews. Okay. But uh, oh, I thought they were like one of the least, most healthiest nuts. Well. Oh, all nuts uh, have some health benefits. <laughs> we mustn't true. be too picky when we get to nuts. They're all fantastic. And they're very expensive, so I, you can't have that much. You know, so mixed nuts are generally what I, mm. what I go for. And, um, yeah, I just find they satisfy me. They fill me up. And they're absolutely packed with polyphenols, ingredient, you know, fibre, everything, everything you need. And, actually, they, they stop you being as hungry at your next meal. And they've got full of really healthy fats. So that's, you know, if I'm offered those, I occasionally um, with, with, a, with my beer we'll have a, uh, some crisps. I'm, I'm a bit, that's what I have a weakness for um, crisps. What flavour? Um, well, my favourite is actually, um, which you can get in France and Spain, is um, salt and extra, extra virgin olive oil crisps. Um, with still a, skin a tint on. of yeah. healthiness isn't I was there, isn't there? Say, I'm even like his pickled snacks. onion <laughs> no, I, all monster munchers no, no, no I wouldn't go because that's not there's a real difference actually between a, a crisp that is made of potato mm -hmm. and the ones that Sarah likes monster munchers and uh, uh, cheese its and, you're, right, um, you're actually wrong on that I, I like a proper classic crisp we're, we're completely <laughs> ultra processed right so people need to dip the difference ones? there's a huge difference I'm actually probably artisan potato crisps are actually pretty healthy, you know, compared to virtually all the other snacks. My granny used to have the ones that came in the white packet that you used to open and then you used to put the salt in. Oh yes, Do you remember I them? remember those. Actual like whole yes, sachet so salt. Yeah, so it's optional. <laughs> Is Up it goes the blood pressure. <laughs> Do you know what crisps are really interesting actually because they are packed with vitamin C, they are packed with potassium, and they're one of our main sources in the UK for some individuals of uh, potassium and vitamin C. Um, I'm not lowers, saying... Which lowers blood pressure. Yeah. So it probably compensates, the, in the potato there's potassium which lowers blood pressure, which probably compensates for the salt which uh, would tend to raise it. So crisps aren't as bad as we all think? No. If they haven't got any, many ingredients in them, yeah. and the, more, the more processed they are, you, know, you need to look at the packet, see what else they've added to it. But if you, if you get pretty pure ones, then, you know, compared to all the other common snacks in the UK, they're actually the one that we worry about least. But people should probably not have them as snacks. They should have them as the French and the Italians and the Spanish do, as an aperitif just before they have their meal. And then you're having it in one meal episode. It's only in the UK that people have them, you know, at the bus stop or... Um, for breakfast uh, or as crisp <laughs> sandwiches. Sarah's crisp cupboard. <laughs> yeah. But like I'm really demonising Sarah and I'm not. Uh, it's just I, because you, you relate to the average person and changing. I think that's She's really changing. important. She's changing. Do you know, I, I'm, I'm partial to the odd crisp sandwich. I do like a crisp there in my go. sandwich occasionally. With white or brown bread is the question. Um, I know I should be having it with brown bread but I like it in white bread. I'm being And that is what most people relate to. I think it's important here. Probably I mean, before she had her glucose monitor on her, I think. Is that right? I must say, since having my glucose monitor, despite working for 20-something years in nutritional research, that's been the biggest impetus for me to change my diet. Not Tim. Okay, so coming on to... <laughs> Sorry, Tim. That's coming right. on to the next part. Being honest. I still won't cry yet. I have started having Tim's breakfast, the one that uh, several million, yeah, that several million people in the UK are, are now having. So Greek yogurt with a little bit of kefir, with some nuts, some seeds, um, and a cheeky smile to the camera thrown in. Oh yeah. <laughs> Although Tim doesn't always have breakfast, which we're going to come on to in a yeah. bit with intermittent fasting. But before we get on to that part, because I feel this is so interesting, the intermittent fasting, and I'm getting really carried away with myself here. I want to talk about sweeteners. Yeah. Because we've just talked about sugar, but now a lot of that ultra processed food is being replaced with sweeteners in the view that they're a healthier alternative. Now, my father grew up, he's, he was a type 2 diabetic through food. He's managed to get him off any medication and stabilizing his blood glucose, which is a revelation because he grew up with meat and two veg, sugar in his tea. He's a builder, very working class. And then he went on to saccharin, which is a sweetener in his tea. And he still has this view that it's incredibly healthy and a much healthier alternative than sugar. So 
I want to kind of bring on this discussion of sweeteners because it is in so many of our foods and fizzy drinks that we consume. And we also have artificial sweeteners versus the natural sweeteners. And there's again, a lot of difference with them. So we're gonna start with the artificial ones. Now saccharin, I think was the first one that was discovered. Now let me get this right, because I actually heard this on a podcast with you, Sarah, on the Zoe podcast. And it was discovered by accident in 1879 when a Russian chemist was studying coal and tar. Now the story goes that he was working with these chemicals. He got a little on his hand and then he tasted it. And that's how he found out that it was very sweet. So whether this is true or not, we're not entirely sure how the story goes, but it was really fascinating because then since World War I, it started to become more readily available within our shops and on our shelves. Now it's zero calorie, so that automatically makes us think that it's healthier. Yep. But is it? What are the most common sweeteners? Because in my view, it's aspartame, which we see a lot in, in Diet Coke and we see a lot in chewing gum and things like that. But are these chemicals actually good for us or are they more harmful than we think? I mean, there's four or five common sweeteners mm. used. So saccharin is used less and less now. It was the, the, the first one, as you said, and came out of manufacture of paraffin, as, as have several of these, uh, come out of industrial processes, as you said, chemicals by accident, uh, just picked up by someone licking their, licking their finger. And they doing shouldn't. what they should not be doing yeah. in any lab. <laughs> yeah, but they do. Um, well, I love it. It's how LSD came around as well. Really? Well, a, yeah. yeah, and also the, <laughs> the the bitter taste test as well, PTC. Mm -hmm. So saccharin came along. Then then you have aspartame and sucralose, which mm -hmm. are worldwide probably the, the two largest, most used ones in, in diet drinks. And there's a difference between countries about whether they have more sucralose or more uh, aspartame. And there's something called ACE-K, which is now used, and increasingly there's a, they use a mixture because they found that a lot of the po population got a bitter metallic taste in their mouth when they had these, uh, these artificial chemicals. And they, they also use a mixture because they bind, each of the sweeteners binds to different parts of our sweet taste receptors. And so, and some bind really quickly and straight away give you that perception of sweet. Some are longer lasting, but slower binding. And so this is why if you look at the kind of sweeteners that are in a lot of products, you'll see that there's a mix because they want you to have that quick hit of sweetness, plus they want it longer lasting. So that's one of the other reasons why, as well as the bitter taste. So it's getting increasingly confusing now when you look at particularly drinks, but also lots of foods and cakes and things where are, which are low calorie to try and work out, oh gosh, which sweeteners in this, because you've got four or five. And then they're also adding in this other group of um, sweeteners called sugar alcohols. So things like xylose and um, all these xanthane gums, which have not as sweet, but they, they can be called natural. And yet, you know, they're, they're, you wouldn't eat them normally. Anyway, so that, it's getting very confusing. Then you've got the stevias which uh, do come from a, a leaf and a plant, mm. but they worked out that uh, the, the ingredient that came from that caused too much bitter metallic taste in too many people, so it got withdrawn. And the stevia that we're now getting is genetically modified and grown by microbes, um, so they produce the type of stevia that doesn't uh, have that metallic taste. So to call it natural, is, it's not like someone's just picking off leaves. Actually, they're made in these giant vats from genetically modified bacteria. We have to be careful what we call natural and unnatural. But the whole thing is a real mix. And I think what's really changed in the last 10 years is, is the realisation that they are absolutely not, as, uh, not a health alternative mm -hmm. that we were promoting 10 years ago. And we're starting to think about studying them properly. Mm -hmm. It's still not being done. And so... You can still bring a, a sweetener onto the market just by doing old-fashioned research into animals, showing they don't get cancer. And you give lots of rodents high doses, and you show, okay, it doesn't cause cancer. Because that was the original worry yes. with saccharin, was people, oh, you know, cancer scare, and it went off the market. And, all the and with sugar. There was a lot of headlines around that for a while as well. Yeah, well, if you, if you feed, feed rodents ridiculous amounts, you know, sort of, thousand times more than you'd ever have in a, in a human 
you can get all kinds of results you want. It doesn't mm. really help. Yeah, and th these studies have been disproven, particularly the ones with sweeteners and um, cancer, mm. because not only did they give these animals super physiological amounts that we could never consume, they also gave it to animals that had a higher risk of developing tumours, regardless of what they were having. So I think the whole sweetener and cancer risk is gone, but we're not saying that they're healthy. <laughs> no, and the other bit of evidence really is that people used to say, oh, if you switch from, say, your standard fizzy drinks to a, to a diet version, um, you'll be healthier, you get less diabetes, you'll lose weight, mm. uh, everything happens. And the studies they've done, and there are large numbers now, 20 or so, some do show some differences in weight loss, majority don't and if there is any difference it's really small and so when you summarize them it's hard to see there's a significant effect of that reduction in calories mm -hmm. and so we're talking you know we should have if there's 150 calories in a can roughly you should be seeing 300 calories if two cans a day most of these trials were and if you you know you're losing 15 percent of your daily calories and you can't see that effect and clearly, that's not a healthy uh, difference. Dentists absolutely are very happy, or less happy because they can less work. So it's definitely good for your teeth, but there's really nothing else proven to be better for. And when you do the studies, you're still seeing metabolic problems of people who have high levels of these artificial sweeteners. And some recent studies have now shown that quite clearly um, that they're not inert in many people can have a metabolic reaction because the idea was this sort of paraffin compound passed through you just tickled your sweet receptors and then you got and it, you peed it out the other end or you know it's magic well it depends on the sweetness so we process each sweetener differently just like it affects our receptors differently in our mouth you know some are metabolized some come out in our urine some just are excreted straight away so they're there for the gut microbiome and this is why we now know that not all sweeteners behave the same way in terms of how they impact our health. Mm -hmm. But what we also know from recent research is not everyone responds the same way to the same sweeteners. So again, it's bringing in that real complexity of oversimplifying as well, that we just can't group all of the sweeteners together. Because do they impair our blood glucose levels? Because that's what a lot of research is showing, that actually we're thinking they're calorie free. As you said, they come in, they tickle our sweet receptors and then they leave our body. We don't think about the impact that's having on our blood glucose like we do with sugar and so mm -hmm. many diabetics try and switch to the alternative or people that are just trying to feel maybe I want to lose weight or, or cut calories out of my diet thinking that it's not having an impact on their blood sugar but actually well there's two sweeteners has been clearly shown mm -hmm. can have an effect and that saccharin and sucralose mm -hmm. have been shown to uh, cause modifications of the blood sugar so they're stimulating something on that pathway that's tickling the insulin and the glucose pathway. We don't understand what it is. Mm. I spent some time in a metabolic chamber in part of my research as well. And I took uh, several sachets of sucralose whilst I'm wearing a glucose monitor in experimental conditions and I got a sugar peak. And everyone says that's impossible. It's inert. It shouldn't do that. So we do realise how little we actually know about these particular products. But as Sarah says... This Israeli study showed that not everybody reacted the same way. So mm. you've got, on top of this sort of unknown mechanism, you've got the fact that some people react much more than others. So some people could be really big reactors to these sweeteners and, uh, and others uh, very little. But what they also showed is that all of the sweeteners that they tested caused a deviation of the gut microbiome. We don't yet know what that caused. So we can only speculate that that had some metabolic effect on the rest of the body and may explain why people don't get the weight loss they should when they're reducing their you know, calories, etc. That could be one of the mechanisms that the, the microbes then produce a whole series of other chemicals which go the way to actually causing weight gain or metabolic problems. What's really interesting with that study that Tim's just talked about, where they fed different individuals different kinds of sweeteners, and what they found is that, like Tim said, the saccharin and the sucralose was particularly bad for the microbiome, but also for your blood sugar control, so your insulin sensitivity. And they found that there were responders and non-responders. 
when they took the stool, so the poo, from the people that responded particularly badly, and they put it into mice, and these are germ-free mice, so these are like clean mice that don't have any other bacteria in them. They put the poo from the responders into the mice, and they found those mice then went on to develop poor blood sugar control. And so this is, although that last bit was in mice, this is a really good hint that there's a causal link that actually the sweeteners might be changing the microbiome and it might be the microbiome that, that is then causing this change in how we respond in terms of our insulin sensitivity and our blood sugar control. I think what's really fascinating here is that we actually have the power to, to change our gut microbiome, which is something that you, you know, said in the beginning of something I've really changed my mind on in the last 10 years, it's not all down to our genes. We do actually yep. have the power to, to change our gut microbiome and it's the food and the stress levels very multifactorial it's not just a couple of things but we do have the power from the foods that we eat to orchestrate a microbiome to actually how we would like it to be or how we would hope it to be so having things such as artificial sweeteners i guess is one area where we can start looking at reducing them it's very hard it's even things like chewing gum a very large majority of the population have chewing gum might have some mints even in those quantities it's inside of it so it's really trying to take that full mindset of how many times a day are you consuming them. Is it true that artificial sweeteners also affect our hunger hormones? Because that's something I think that's been spoken about a lot, that we consume something like a Diet Coke or a diet drink and actually makes us hungrier. So is it having the opposite effect? So there's some research looking into exactly this, looking at the different hormones that are released in response to food and therefore also in response to sweeteners and how it affects those hormones. There's no clear consensus and this goes back to the problem that it's really difficult to study sweeteners because there's so many different types. But actually what's really difficult is that sweeteners are hidden in so many foods. Mm -hmm. So people typically think, oh, they're in a you know can of Diet Coke or something. But actually the majority of our sweeteners come from foods that you might not even be aware of. And so I've been particularly surprised recently since I've been doing some research around sweeteners in just how many foods they're in. I was recently in a supermarket trying to pick out some foods as part of a project I was doing to show what foods had sweeteners and didn't. And there were even gut-friendly yogurts, so I won't give the brand of these, that have this beautiful marketing about how gut-friendly they are and healthy they are. And they're a brand that I consider to be very healthy. And when I looked at the back of pack labeling, they were packed with sweeteners. And the other thing as well that I think is really misleading around sweeteners is there's so many products that say low sugar, no sugar, or reduced sugar. Anything that says low, no, or reduced in terms of sugar just has sweeteners in. Yeah, you've in got to assume place. they've got sweeteners like children's yogurts and these yeah, things. Yeah, so now. look on the back. So I buy for my kids, or uh, uh, unknowingly until the last few weeks, I get the low sugar tomato ketchup. Um, but actually, I had a look and it's just packed with sweeteners. And the problem is, is people have... Oh, I just don't think people are aware. I mean, I know you don't want to call it the brand, but can you name the brand so people are aware of what this is? So I wasn't aware, and I'm a nutritional scientist. And um, What was the yoghurt brand? I know you, you feel worried to say it, but would you feel happy just to... So it's one of the Activia this. brands. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't want to just highlight them. When I looked at the tomato ketchup, it wasn't just Heinz or just Sainsbury's. You know, it was all of the brands are doing this because to reduce it, we've still got to meet people's taste requirements we've still got to meet what people actually want to consume and what they want mm. to which comes back to what we were talking about at the beginning that once you start to be reductionist and say yep. we must reduce fat we must reduce sugar then the food industry loves it because they've got cheaper alternatives that are probably worse or as bad for us mm. in different ways mm -hmm. that are just suddenly disguised in ways we all know when we drink a, a coke or a pepsi that that's got sugar in it. You pay a price if you like, you like it, you don't, but you know you know what's in it. Now we've got this environment where we're having lots of unhealthy stuff dressed as healthy. And I think in a way, for me, that's worse. We're losing that transparency of our food. And you know, it's, it's worth billions and billions. So the companies are defending these artificial sweeteners at all costs and get very upset when anyone criticizes them and they pay for all kinds of reviews to um, sort of whitewash it and say, well, everyone, it's still controversial, we don't really know what's going on. But no government body is ever saying to them, before you launch a new sweetener, you know, test it on the microbiome in, in 100 people. I mean, it, compared to 
the, the costs on health. This is trivial. The thing is, it's a, it, I do think it's a really difficult situation. This is where Tim and I disagree a lot with my opinion of how challenging it is for the food industry. So sugar tax came in a couple of years ago by the government. Mm. And so do the food industry therefore make the products more expensive to consumers? Well, no, because it will hit the poorest. It will hit those most you know, social economically deprived. And so instead, they've reformulated their products. They've reformulated them to have more sweeteners instead of having this high level of sugars. Mm. And it's a real challenge because also they have to meet the needs of the, the, the requests of the consumers. And consumers, are, I know, are used to having these foods, so I know there's a responsibility as well for, by the food industry to try and reduce even further and try and adapt our taste perceptions, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think they're in a very difficult position, but... Uh, well, t- Tim will counterbalance that with Well, his. because they're, they're <laughs> at the table deciding what those regulations are. And mm. uh, they are... They're, well, they, don't decide, they didn't decide on the sugar tax, I don't think. The I think they did. Really no, I think it was all done in consultation yeah. with the government. going to end up now? Yeah, well... <laughs> but, I mean, no, d- don't get me wrong. I think, you know, the food industry would be quite happy if there's an, a, 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 the playing field is even mm. and they know what to aim at. And that's why they like these black and white rules, so mm. they can do something to it. I'm not saying they're driving it at all. Mm. I think it's you know it's partly our sort of incompetence and public health that's driving it, um, and they're just reacting to it. But uh, I don't think it's also fair to say that you know, um, you know we've got the solution and uh, the sugar tax is you know a good e- e- example. Yeah, it shows that all sugar tax showed is if once you make a rule, you you can switch behavior and food companies really quickly Hmm. and so we could do that for ultra processed food overnight if we wanted to yeah i mean i think the sugar tax is an example of where it's a double-edged sword and that's really what i wanted to illustrate that it there's just there isn't an easy win in a lot of these situations i think that it's really important before we move on from sweeteners to say whether you know what our recommendation is because whenever I talk about sweeteners people always say okay this is really confusing now because we know sugar's bad for us now you're saying sweeteners is bad for us what on earth do I do so many uh, products have them and so my recommendation is to try and avoid sweeteners if you can but I would say based on the current evidence I would recommend if you do want something sweet it's better based on what we currently know to have an artificially sweetened product than it is to have the full sugar product but I would try and not actually consume as many of them as well, possible. I know that you've also just blown this out of the water as well because my next part was you have the natural sugars versus artificial ones and okay I actually know that stevia now is more seen as an artificial than a natural but you do by have. Me, but maybe not. By, yeah. It won't be in the advertising. No but me. it does but have different health, it does it have different health effects. It doesn't impact your blood glucose yep. as much as the artificial ones and so mm-hmm. I it's interesting that a couple of people said to me, well, can you ask about the more natural sugars? Because is that better for me yep. to take as a diabetic than, than the artificial ones such as a saccharin? And so I think this is where it gets more confusing, is actually, well, should they be leaning more towards the natural side of, of, of sweeteners than the, than the artificial ones? Because there is, there is still a bit of a difference with the health benefits. Yes, if you've got a choice between one derived from paraffin and one derived from a, a plant leaf originally, then... <coughs> In general, you're, you're better off going for the plant leaf one because you say, okay, in theory, a version of it exists that you might, you know, someone might have eaten at some point in, but in history. But I think also, Tim, the evidence shows, and I know you've talked about this before with Stevia from the, the Israeli study that Tim mentioned, the evidence from that shows that Stevia seems to have a neutral effect. And I think I would say, watch your space, that we're not clear on the evidence yet. Yeah. The evidence does seem to be for stevia that actually it might have a neutral effect. There's even some evidence that it might have a favourable effect on our microbiome, but I'm a bit cautious saying that. Um, <laughs> I'd be very cautious really. saying that. But, um, but yeah, no, and so I, I would agree at the moment, you know, I'd say, listen, we need much more research and let's be suspicious of these things until you've got decent data on hundreds of people that you actually say okay it really is fine Mm -hmm. if you get a choice between the two the old-fashioned ones and the new ones yeah go for go for something like a a modified genetically modified stevia Mm -hmm. if if it doesn't taste horrible to you because i think a lot of people put off that or you go for these sugar alcohols and i think there's increasing evidence that actually they do exist in nature Mm -hmm. and some of them are also likely to be neutral as well but 
realise you are playing with the devil here because uh, you don't really know how it's all made and put together and um, you're not getting the whole plant, the whole, mm. you know, the whole food that we, sh we want to be teaching people from. And all of these things, particularly in kids, raises their thresholds for sweetness. And so until we start grasping this as a society, our sweet tooth is our main problem and start to just wean people off it, we're screwed. We're going to have, you know, really unhealthy diets mm. full of this stuff mm. that is naturally leads people down this ultra processed route. Mm. Start getting kids, you know, having bitter fruits and vegetables and drinking tea without sugar and herbal drinks and things that are healthy mm. without trying to think there's this magic bullet mm. that uh, we can do because it's not good for everybody to have this really high um, sweetness threshold. Kids get, you know, need satiation. It's very hard for them. They said, oh, it's not sweet enough for me because they're just so used to either sugar or these artificial sweeteners. It keeps it really high. They can't eat real foods. And I think to me, that's, that's one of the main reasons, particularly for parents, that they should be avoiding these. Can you move into my house for a month? I was going to say, what happens when kids, kids just say no? Because <laughs> I have a nephew who just doesn't want to touch anything apart from just, sweet foods. So I'm really Tim's going to come and deal it. with my kids. Just don't buy it and say, Tim said I can't. <laughs> <laughs> my kids will say, Tim, you don't do what Tim says. <laughs> That's true. You're starting to change. Yes. starting to change but before we kind of wrap up I really want to make sure we hit upon the study that you're releasing at the moment because I think a lot of our listeners will probably um, hopefully want to get involved because it's not just about what you eat it's also about how you eat which goes into the timing now Tim I know you've spoken about intermittent fasting time restricted eating for a long time which is why I pulled up on your breakfast because I thought there's some days when you do miss breakfast so a lot of this goes into chronobiology, which we might not have time to dissect as much as I wish we could today, but I definitely would advise people to look that up and, and, and research a bit more about that, which looks into our circadian rhythms. But intermittent fasting is a very broad term, and it can cover many different things. You're looking at time-restricted eating. Can you just give me and our listeners an overview of what that means? Because intermittent fasting can actually have a much broader terminology, which sits under many different things of how we can look at reducing food timings within our diets. Yeah, many people might think intermittent fasting means the old, uh, 10 years ago, Michael Mosley and 5-2, mm -hmm. and the idea you ate normally for five days and then two days a week you restricted your calories to 500 calories or 25% of your normal, uh, and you just sort of suffered for a day and then you knew you could eat whatever you like the next day. And that turned out to be not quite as good as we thought it was. It started off well, but it's really hard to sustain, mm -hmm. and your body starts to get used to it and compensates for it. So uh, what we're looking at is not changing the amount you eat, but just changing the time window. Mm -hmm. And this is where this term, time-restricted eating. So you, know, you can eat as much as you like in that time, or we hope just people will eat the same amount, but rather than eating over what most people do is eating over a f sort of 14 to 16 hours, we want people to eat in a, like a 10 to 12 hour window, which is quite doable, and leaving that extra time overnight particularly, or in the morning, where the body can help repair itself, the microbes can help repair the gut, and all the studies are starting to show that that improves your metabolism, as well as your metabolism can in some cases help stop you gaining weight and in some cases uh, mm. lose it. That's the key here is it's, we're not trying to, you know, it's not a diet. I think that's a big thing, isn't it, actually? Mm -hmm. You're kind of saying whatever you eat within that eight to 10 hour window, which can feel doable if you're, for many people, and that's actually why I want to come onto this, is does it suit everybody, especially women with hormones and versus men? But for people that might break their fast at 11, 12, and then close their fast at, eight to nine feels a bit more manageable than actually trying to do it throughout the working day and breaking their fast at three, four in the afternoon. So I know you're about to conduct this research. I'd love to get you back on to find what the findings are afterwards. But from research that's done so far, what is the optimal time to do this? Because some people might be thinking, well, I can easily miss my breakfast, but some people might think my breakfast is my favorite meal of the day. So how could people adjust if they feel that breakfast is actually their favourite meal of the day? Because for many people, like my mum, 
were told to eat like kings in the morning and mm. like paupers in the evening. And so changing that mindset and habits can be really hard. Before we get into the details, I mean, the, this study is designed, you know, it's the big uh, if study we're calling it, for intermittent fasting, allows people to choose their own times that they want to do it. Mm. And this is very much exactly what we want to find out because the data isn't out there. All the studies have been very small scale. Mm. And yes, when it's done in a laboratory and, you know, places under total control, it turns out that in young people, fasting... Uh, in the evenings and, and eating in the mornings generally has a better metabolic profile outcome. But the numbers are small and they haven't done it for older people and we don't have enough data on women, for example, to know exactly what's going on. So we suspect that there are morning and evening people mm. and also we want it to fit in with people's lives. There's no point in telling people, you know, optimally for your health, do this but you know you're not allowed to eat anything after three o'clock so you can never go out and meet friends or have a social life that's clearly stupid mm. so what we're trying to do is to do this mass experiment we'd love to get a million people doing this so we've got all the data that we can tease them into these groups and people not only will find out for themselves what suits them but also you know we can inform the whole world and get the message out there mm. about all the ways to do this and, and what works and which people it doesn't work for. It may be overhyped. We don't really know. Yeah, I think this is so important generally in the field of nutrition research that we can try and think about how we translate in a really pragmatic way what we find from these really tightly controlled clinical trials that we do to how they actually translate in the noisy way in which we live our lives. Mm -hmm. And time-restricted eating is you know, a great study that we're kicking off with the Zoe Health Intervention Studies on. And that's because we know, like Tim said, from the small studies that it might work. But these are conducted in a way that actually, if you translate them to real life, are just either really hard to follow, are not sustainable, mm. and actually we just don't know who they work for. And that's what's really exciting with this work and uh, that we're going to do, that we're going to be able to look how does it really matter in the noisy way you live your life? But also address some of the unanswered questions to do a time-restricted eating. Mm. And so you touched on this with your question, that is it due to energy intake? Is it due to weight? Is you know What is it about time-restricted eating that seems to have these favorable effects? And we don't actually know. Mm. What we do know is that even if you don't have any change in energy intake or any change in weight, you still get improvements in lots of health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So even where there's no improvement in weight, people that have practiced time-restricted eating, again, this just comes from these really small, tightly controlled studies, they have improvements in blood pressure, in inflammation, in blood lipids, in so many different cardiovascular risk factors, in insulin sensitivity, in glucose control. What we also know is that if people go on time-restricted eating diets and are told, look, don't worry about changing the amount of food you're eating, that actually unintentionally they do tend to reduce their food intake. Mm. So they do tend to reduce their energy intake by about 300 calories. Mm. So you do tend to get a little bit of weight loss. But what's great is that the actual benefits are from the inside out, that you're getting these really favorable metabolic changes and health changes that then are going to be in the long term, maybe may also help reduce weight for those that want to, but it's doing it in that more sustainable way. I've been doing this for a while now and I find it pretty easy to do, depending on the day. It depends around my work schedule and weekends and whatever, but if you pick the right day, it's pretty easy to do it. Sarah knows she's gonna find it very difficult. I, I'm going to give it a go, and I'm going to give it a go. Because she's for always, 10 hours. she always saying <laughs> she's always hungry, right? It's all that sugary rating, Sarah. She says <laughs> too many crisp sandwiches. That's the problem. But I, I get very hungry. Poor Tim's going to hate working with me when I'm doing <laughs> the time restricted eating so, stuff. But that's what fascinating to see. Is there really <laughs> some people that don't tolerate is this? Is it more women or, and hormones? Is yeah, there a massive? We don't link know. There? We don't well, know. This is the thing: is that you know nobody knows this, and interestingly as well, Menopause Day yesterday, and I was doing quite a lot of communications um, and interviews yesterday and lots of people are asking me exactly this what about time restricted eating for females does it matter whether you're pre or post menopause we don't know and this is what's really exciting by doing this huge citizen science project we're going to have the numbers to be able to tease to you know tease that apart but also look at the question that tim mentioned earlier about early versus late time restricted eating i find eating. that fascinating that actually for younger people it's better to have breakfast and and, and less so at the dinner because mm. i would have automatically thought 
it's the other way around. Well, that's the original idea of, you know, breakfast like a king. Yeah. Uh, comes from that because all the studies yeah. were done in young people. So all the metabolic studies that we believe for the last 30 years were done in about 10 young people. Mm -hmm. They were never done in 60-year-old uh, women who may be the complete opposite. And I know, because I've done lots of these studies with, with Zoe, is that for me, I actually metabolize my food, my glucose better in the evenings than the mornings. And there may be other people like me. Um, but, you know, it's got to be that difference between health and sustainability and lifestyle. And I think what we want, really want is, as Sarah says, it's got to be practical. To be any use, you've got to sustain this for years. Yeah. Not just uh, for a few weeks. But also do it in a way that's motivational for you, that you know you're getting the maximum benefit. So mm -hmm. going back to what Tim said about the time of day, we know from the Zoe Predict studies that younger individuals have a particularly strong time of day effect. So if they consume high carbohydrate meals in the morning, they are more insulin sensitive compared to when they consume them later in the day. So they have a lower sugar response in the morning. As you get older, this seems to peter out. So for older individuals, obviously um, Tim's far too young uh, to be in that category. But for people above the age of 60, for example, once you get to that age, there's less of a pronounced effect. So maybe for those individuals, early versus late time restricted eating doesn't really matter. Maybe mm -hmm. we should just be guiding younger individuals. These are all the kind of things that we need to think about. And also the one in five people who are on shift work. Who yeah, do that's a huge, that's that, that's really a huge problem. Area of research. Who have the most problems with their food mm -hmm. and health and circadian rhythms. We simply don't know how to uh, advise them. And this is, you know, if we can get some of those people involved, uh, you know, which has an you know, incredible amount of our population we just aren't giving the right advice to. We simply don't, yeah, don't study them. There, there's a fantastic study that came out a week ago from uh, Sachin Panda's group who does a lot of work on time-restricted eating. And this was in firefighters in the west coast of, of America where the, he took um, firefighters that were doing night shifts and he put them on a time-restricted eating diet and he looked at, obviously, time of day, etc. and stuff. And he found that actually it was a really good way of reducing some of these cardiovascular risk factors that we know are increased in people that do shift work. So related to that, so when we're looking at intermittent fasting, if you can give me one or two quick fire answers on this, this is great. So there's a lot of myths about revolving intermittent fasting. And for anyone wanting to come on to this study and trial, these are questions that they might be thinking before they're signing up. Yep. Does coffee break our fast? Not if it's black and no, no sugar. Can we fast for too long? Because many people can do like 72 hours of fasting and say they've got amazing health benefits. I would say, I would say you can fast for too long. We don't suggest anyone fast for, for more than 24 hours. Uh, and listen to how you feel. This is really important. If you're feeling dizzy, weak, etc., even only doing the 10-hour fast, then break the fast. Can it improve our brain health? Yes, I believe so. Can it slow down our metabolism? I guess this is going to die its more so. Yeah. But actually, it can interfere with their metabolism and make it more sluggish. So people might be worried if they're doing time restricted eating, could it slow down the metabolism? We don't know. There's no evidence around this yet. But time restricted eating should be what our ancestors were doing. So it's what we've evolved for. These are all just facts that I decided to google and come up with what what are people googling around this what are the areas of concern and are there any risks for most people there are no risks but everyone's an individual so you just mm. got to do what f feels normal and healthy for you yeah i agree so where can people sign up so if people are now like okay i want to trial this i'd love to become involved and they're healthy where can they go to sign up for this study because it will be launching or would have been launched when this comes out in november Yes, yeah, so studies are ongoing, and if you want to join, you download the from any the app store, um, Zoe Health Study app, and find a simple way to get into the study. You have to give your consent, and you get most out of it if you also fill in a health and diet questionnaire as well. And it's not a diet, is it? It's basically no. people carrying on with their normal lives, but they're just bringing in this restricted time eating window, so they might stop eating it. 7 p.m. at night and might start eating at 11 a.m. in the morning. So it's not actually changing anything around their diet. Not changing anything at all, no. And no. they don't have to do anything you don't want to do. It's completely free. You can stop at any time. We want people to do it uh, a week 
run in on their normal diets and you're recording how you feel, your energy levels, appetite, etc. And then you go on to changing your, your meal times and you record then how you, you're feeling and you know then that's just a minimum of two weeks. It's very easy to do and we want as many people to take part and to share it, get all your friends, your family to do it. Mm-hmm. And the more data we've got, the more insights we're, we're all going to get. And it's a great opportunity as well for people to be citizen scientists. So they're going to help educate us as scientists and for us to be able to develop advice that we can feed back to people. But they will also get daily insights. So everyone taking part in the study will have their own daily insights delivered to them about how their mood, their energy, their hunger, their sleep, for example, compared to the day before. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Well, we'll put that in the show notes. People can go and click on it and sign up. And um, I'm definitely going to be getting involved. So I will let you know when we get you back on to find out what the results are. So I always leave, which you both know, the podcast with my final question. And I wonder if it's going to be different to what you said last time. So Tim, what does live well, be well mean to you? It means getting up every morning, looking forward to the day, feeling happy and energised and generally optimistic. All about the state of mind. I think it's now more about the state of mind. I mean, I think the mind and the body are together, Mm -hmm. but generally, if you feel that way, it's because everything is pulling together, your body and your mind, and uh, yeah, you're just full of enthusiasm and energy for the next 24 hours. I think that's really, I think we've got to start thinking, you know, short term, there's no point doing long term planning, just take every day as it comes Mm -hmm. and uh, enjoy it to the max. The equilibrium. I completely agree. The present moment. And I think I love that you said that and not think about the gut microbiome. <laughs> Sarah, what does live well, be well mean to you? Well, I now remember you asking this last time. I think my answer is going to be the same as what I recall it was last time, which was just being content. That is like what Tim you said. said, living in the moment and just not sweating the small stuff that really it just doesn't matter. Mm. Because again, high stress one of the worst things for our health isn't it so i guess the content the present the equilibrium is really important the mind the body is all connected so thank you for that insight thank you for coming on thank you for coming back to Pleasure. season nine and we'll get you on in season 10 for the results because i'm very interested to see actually what mm. the what the health outcomes will be from the time restricted eating study so we'll speak to you then Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Live Well, Be Well. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please can I ask one huge favour. If you could subscribe, share and rate this podcast, it would mean an immense amount to me and all the fantastic guests who come on to share their expertise and knowledge with us. It will keep this podcast growing and it will allow us to continue making episodes. Until next week, I hope you all live well and be well.